Open your Bibles to Hebrews, 11th chapter, last two verses. We've looked through this chapter 11 pretty good. Now we're looking at verse 39, 30, uh, 39 and 40. <clears throat> you remember that the writer uh, broke uh, the old covenant period into three groupings and then uh, pushed it into the church age in verse 39 and 40. Also, you recall that he <clears throat> developed uh, a doctrinal principle of the faith cycle that he put in every grouping. I put it on your paper at the top. So here we are looking at 39 and 40. All of these, speaking of the old covenant believers, that was closed out in verse 38. Verse 39, all of these having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us that they are the old covenant believers and the us are the new covenant believers. So that apart from us, new covenant believers, they old covenant believers should not be made perfect or complete their faith talking about their faith their faith that's kind of an interesting idea and we'll explain what that means tonight and uh, it's a marvelous doctrinal principle uh, again look remember it just in review uh, the first paragraph on your paper talks about the four groupings and the second paragraph on your paper talks about the doctrinal principle given to each grouping. Um, and we're in the final one, which is the church period. Uh, tonight, we're going to look at five aspects of the old covenant believers gaining approval through their faith without receiving the promise, but were completed by faith, by the faith of the new covenant believers. What an interesting concept that is. And, uh, I mean, what does that mean? It will be our study tonight. We'll, we'll explain what all that means. Well, remember that the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality, evidence of carnality. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 3rd chapter, verse 3. The evidence is personal sin. Could be mental attitude sins or sins of the tongue, revert sin. What that does is hinder the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit called spirituality. When you confess your sin, according to 1 John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The cleansing, the work of Christ from the cross, works in the believer's life by confession of sin, realizing it was all dealt with by Christ and his blood on the cross. Is, is put back into the spiritual ministry. In other words, put back into spirituality, moves them out of carnality and back into spirituality. So I give you a moment as a believer or priest to examine personal sin in your life, make confession if necessary in privacy. And we'll begin our study tonight under the ministry, teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so, our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way by the automobile and those who are visiting by the Internet. For those on the Internet, we thank them for coming. And if they're new people, we encourage them. Uh, pick a night and stay with it. If it's Tuesday night, stay with it, or Wednesday night, or Sunday. or If you're bold enough, go through all three, night, all three lessons, but stay with one consistently. That would be my encouragement. I pray the Holy Spirit would teach us great truths tonight, according to John 14, 26. It is his responsibility to teach and recall it in the Christian soul. We're thankful for that principle. For sometimes we um, don't realize sometimes in the midst of a ministry 
uh, exactly how that thing is supposed to move and, and to be operated. And the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's job is to do that. That's called spirituality, living in the power of the Holy Spirit. We're thankful for that. We understand it and we're thankful for it. I pray others would too as well. So we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, point number one tonight uh, is taking a look at verse 39. This is really important. 2 Peter 3.16 tells us to do what? Put your thinking cap on. You know, you got to put your thinking cap on because there's some things you cannot see in the English that are dy dynamic in the Greek. In verse 39, now we know who all, all of these, because we've been studying from chapter, the whole chapter down to 38 is old covenant believers. It, and it, the, he divided it in three groups, the antediluvian period, uh, the patriarch period, and the Jewish period. And then he goes to the church period with us tonight. So all of these Old Testament, Old Covenant believers have gained approval. Now that's a really interesting way of translating martyrero. Martyrero is the word witness. It is the word testify. It is the word martyr. And to have that translated gaining approval how do you get that? You understand? I'll tell you how you get it. Notice I wrote that it's an aorist passive participle. It's an aorist passive participle, nominative plural masculine, referring to all of these, all of these having gained approval. What he's talking about, looking at all of these, are the generational historical impact. We went from the anti. The, there, there had to be a pivot in the antediluvian period to carry the baton to the patriarch period, from the patriarch period to the Jewish period, from the Jewish period to the church age. The baton had to be like in a race. It had to be passed on, and it's always passed on to the pivot. The pivot is always the one who carries it, not not the greater number. It is the pivot that are dedicated to the to the will and plan of God. And this is exactly what he's done. He didn't go and show you all of the antediluvian period. He picked out some of the guys who were, who were definite pivots, uh, who walked the walk of faith even unto death, like Abel. So uh, that's the one part of that. This is a, a generational idea. That's a generational idea. Uh, the passive voice here. Notice the P is passive. The passive voice shows that the subject is um, being acted upon. Is, is, uh, the subject is being acted upon. It's not acting, it's being acted upon. All these having gained approval, generational impact uh, upon their generation their, and their, their, their generational group. Uh, through their faith, notice there's a definite article with faith, we, we would re re reference you to the faith cycle. Did not receive. Did not receive. Did not receive. Do you get that? Did not receive. Uh, Komizo is an aorist middle indicative. And the middle voice here is a negative, a negative middle, which means they were not benefited. It was, it, they were not benefited by it. In other words, to the to something. They weren't benefited to an ultimate goal. Watch this now. Having gained approval through their faith, did not receive the promise. Notice it's singular. Not promises, promise. A specific promise. They, they lived their life by faith and they all died without receiving. Remember, we saw that in verse 13 without receiving the promise. I mean, there is a major goal of it. Now look, it could be a gate question. That promise was the coming of Christ. Just like ours, we walk by faith in the promise that Christ is coming again eminently at any point in time. In the old covenant, they walked by faith looking for the coming of imminent coming of Christ. He, he, he was supposed to come. He could have come in any one of those periods. 
just like he could come any day in this period. So that's, that's really important that we understand what the writer is talking about. Notice he put a definite article with the word promise. Gained approval in the English is translated, gain, the word gained approval. Uh, in, in, in the English translation, for example, in the New American Standard Bible, uh, it's called um, uh, gained approval. In the King James Bible, it's called obtained a good report. Right? Gain, obtained a good report. In the NIV Bible, it's translated commended. Commended. The Greek verb, materero, means to bear witness or to testify. Materera was used in the 11th chapter, verse 2. In the 11th chapter, verse 2, it is translated in, in the New American Standard Bible. The same word now, I'm showing you, the same word is translated gained approval. In verse 4, in, if you look at Hebrews 11, 4, it's translated testimony. Do you see the word Testimony. Isaiah, I don't. What did King James say? Testimony. I forgot to look. Verse four, testify, testimony. It's got to be witness. Witness. Okay, witness. Same word. In verse five, it's in verse five. Same word in verse five. Obtain the witness. They something about obtain the witness in the no, New American Standard. Testimony. Prop, testimony. <laughs> See, same word. See. It, the, that word can be used this many ways. And then back in verse 39, you see what's interesting to me because I like markers. Verse 2 and verse 39. See, this whole thing began in verse 2 after the mechanics of faith was given in verse 1. This, all of these began in verse 2 and ran, runs all the way to 39. He started with creation, you, you remember, and then he ran it all the way out. See, verse 2 to verse 39, that's bookends of the whole subject of faith, not only in the Old Covenant, but in the New Covenant. Agreed? Because verse 39 took us to the church age. That's just, I just find that just kind of interesting. For a guy like me, that's just kind of like interesting things there. And so you pay attention to things like verse 2 and verse 39 as he starts it and ends it, like, like bookends. The second thing, and so it's really important that we understand some of these things. The second thing that's important to me, at least in this passage, in spite of gaining approval through the faith cycle of their life, these old covenant believers didn't receive the promise. In fact, in verse 13, they all died in faith without receiving the promise. They died in faith without receiving the promise. Komizo, as an aorist, middle, indicative, means to bear something in the middle in the middle, it means to bear something that would be to their advantage or benefit. That's the po power of the middle voice. Now, you just have to pay attention to that. 101 Greek tells you that. It tells you that there's an active, a passive, and a middle voice. And they're basic. I haven't said anything that's not basic Greek. But it is important because... You can put this active, you can put it passive, or you can put it middle, and when you do, the writer's trying to tell you something. So here's what he's trying to tell you about the word receive. It means to bear something that would be to their advantage or benefit middle voice. Do you understand that? That's just the way the middle voice works, people. Okay? Although they gained approval for their faith, their faith didn't benefit them receiving the promise. Do you understand what they just said? Right. Okay. What they had to contend with to maintain their consistent walk of faith is described in Hebrews 10, 35 and 36. You see, they got a problem. Look, they got a problem. They're walking their life out by faith. They're deeply committed, and they keep looking for them coming in Christ. He's not coming in their lifetime, and they were just for sure he was going to come. And he didn't, and they died. 
they didn't receive the promise. Now, over in the 10th chapter, verse, uh, what, 35, 36? I said, read it, so let me read it. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. You know, we often do that when we don't get what we want, right? Well, I've been praying, Pastor, and I don't get it. For you have need of endurance. Why doesn't God give us what we want when we want it? Because he wants to teach you some things that's beneficial to your life. It's to your advantage. One of the things is to teach you endurance and patience. For, listen, for you have need of endurance. Last night, we, we took a look at the edification complex and how it's developed in the, in the believer's soul. And, and it shows you how it's developed. And in there, you would see the importance of endurance. The importance of endurance so that he can teach you some of these things because these virtues are what he wants out of your life. These are the characters of God in the human in the humanity of man, in the redeemed humanity of man, these are the virtues of God. And so he gives us testing and trials because we have need of something greater, something better. So that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. That's a principle. There's a whole principle there. All right? You may not get it right away. If he's promised to, to you, you will get it at some point. What, he, what the 11th chapter says, you may not get it until you die. Think about that. Is that not what he told you? <laughs> That's what he told me. And so he's built your character looking for it so that you could reflect God in humanity. If you've, if, you've, if you've seen Christ, you've seen God. If you've seen Christ, you've seen me. Or if you've seen me, you've seen Christ. If you've seen Christ, you've seen God, right? That's how it works. Let me tell you, that's what people have a hunger for is God. And let me tell you, when you can reflect God in your flesh to other people, they listen to you. I did. I still do. Comizo. So they were not benefited. By, they were not benefited by all the grace benefits associated with the coming of Christ into the world. Church age period. I say this all the time, and I, you don't take it serious with me, but you live in the most unique period of human history, and that's what the writer's saying. All these people lived ahead of you, never got what you got, commonplace. See, your, your experience in Christ started right out with what they looked for and didn't get. And I don't think we understand the privilege we have of that. Maybe be, being born with a silver spoon, you know, or whatever. I don't know. I, I don't know why we should, but certainly the Holy Spirit would drive you like crazy to this, in my opinion. I don't think we understand how beneficial we have it, how, how good we have it in Christ, as far as the faith system working. What we are told by this Hebrews 11 is that they would not be completed, the old covenant believers, whoever they were, even Father Abraham, right? They would not be completed until Christ came into the world. We call it the incarnation. Here's the third point. I want you to really pay attention to the third point. I'm looking at verse 40. At the top of your, at the top of your pay, second paper. Let me pick up 39 again. All these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive 
the promise. Verse 40, because. Now the word because, there is a, a Greek word. It's not there. It's in the genitive. Genitive singular masculine. Because God, definite article, the God, because the, the God had provided something better for whom? But who, for who, people? Who's the us? New covenant believers. I want that to sink in a minute. But God, but the God, that's the author of the plan, but God had provided something better for us, church age believers. So that, that's he plus the subjunctive to give you the wise or the divine purpose so that apart from us, who's the us? New covenant believers. They, who are they? Old covenant believers would not be made perfect. Teleo means completed. Their faith will not be completed until Christ comes. And we're the key to it. New covenant believers. The patans passed off to us and they all win the race. Right? The first heat doesn't what doesn't even matter if the first the first ra ra racer out the runner out doesn't matter if he beat everybody on the first run, right? It doesn't matter if the second one does. It doesn't matter if the third one does. But it does matter if the last one does. Would you agree with that? In a medley relay, it's the last guy. The last guy's got to beat his what we call the heat. He's got to beat his heat. That that group that runs in that specific period of time. Right? So whose shoulders is it in to win? Us. The Patons and ours. There, there's no more runners. According to Hebrews 11, this is it. And we run till what? Till Christ comes. When he comes, it completes the race. We run till Christ comes. They ran till he came. We pick the baton up. We run till he comes. We tell you that every Eucharist. Do we not? It's a big emphasis in my life. I, I talk about it all the time. Now, I want you to go back and look at this verse. Now, I'm going to show you something. Pay attention to this. This is dynamite. See the word provided? Point three in the verse. Do you see the word provided? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's, a, that's a compound Greek. The pro on it means ahead or before. And blippo means to see. Means to see ahead. Or to foresee. You say to me, well, Ron, how in the world did they translate that provide when it's all about seeing? The key word is blippo. The preparation put on the front directs it. Do you understand that? I mean, how in the world did these guys translate that provide when it's about seeing? I'll tell you why. This 4C is the eternal plan of God, but notice this is an aorist middle participle. Now, I'm going to tell you something, and this you got to listen to me. The middle voice in the Greek language can be identified three different ways. It can be identified as an intensive middle, a reflexive middle, or a reciprocal middle. Now, it's still a middle voice. But you see, there, it shows you some other thing, and it can be so powerful that it can change a meaning. This is an intensive middle, which means 
The middle voice says, here's what the middle voice says. The middle voice says that the subject participates with a reason to be benefited, to, to have an advantage, participates. The intensive use of the middle voice, right, means to produce. To per, per, to, participating to produce. That's the intensive middle. If you study the Greek language, 101 Greek, and they teach you active voice, middle voice, passive voice, and they do, we do here. As soon as you get out of 101 Greek, you go back to the tense, to the voices and you explain to them intensive, reflexive, and reciprocal. Now, sometimes... It's not really, it doesn't really change the meaning. If it's a reciprocal, it's because you've got plural people actively engaged in it. If you have reflexive, then it's the guy participating and he's doing it with motive and, and gain idea and all of that. It, it, he's looking to, to put him in an advantage place or be benefited. But intensive is really the key. And here it means to participate to produce. Participating to produce. I am participating in order to produce. Now, who's the subject? Who's the subject? God. God. God is the subject. God, God because God has provided. You say God has provided. He God has provided. Prolipo. He has provided. Notice that the word provided, now listen to me. Notice that the word provided is genitive, like God is. It's genitive, singular, masculine. Notice that the verb is genitive, singular, masculine. It has to be that way in order for it to do, it, do this. Foreseen, this is God's foreseen, the eternal plan of God. Now look, here's a gate question. When did that all take place? Eternal life. eternal life conference. What this word foreseen produced, what this means in theology, me, what it means in the English is, is to foresee, to participate, to produce. And, they, and who's the subject? God. And so what we call this in theology, as it works out in our life, we call it foreordained. Something foreordained. Oh, I'd write that down if I was you. Foreordained. Now, let's stop here a minute because this is, this is what the writers, this is exactly what the writers told us to see. Watch this now. What has been, in our subject matter of Hebrews 11, what has been foreordained? Something better. Something better. What is it? It is the old covenant believers being completed, their faith being completed by ours. Do you understand that? That's what this is all about, isn't it? Wait. Verse 39 and 40, is it not that we carry the baton, we win the race, and everybody wins, right? right? This is saying that God foreordained this, that all this playing out in human history was foreordained by God, and God is working to produce it. Do you understand your life in this? Do you understand your place in that picture. We're carrying the final, we're the final runner in the race that's been foreordained and he's got uh, the race covered and the runners covered and everything else about it is covered, covered. Your life is covered, people. It is, why do you worry about what you worry? You're just a worry wart. 
You worry about things you shouldn't need to worry about. Worry solves nothing. What has that ever solved in your life? Well, I'll worry it to victory. Well, you don't have to run then. If you can just sit and worry. Of course it doesn't. Listen, because God has provided, that that's the whole, he put it in the Greek language in such a way that it forces a guy like me to have to explain it to you because you would never see that. How would you ever see what I just taught you? That's why you come here to Bible study. Because I'm driven for you to know this. You know why? Because you're running the race. Listen, second, write this down. Second Timothy 4, 7, and 8. Run the good, you know, run it, run it to finish. Right? Paul says, run the race. First Corinthians, the ninth chapter, run the race. Run the race, finish the course, keep the faith. All of that's attached to this idea. Every bit of that's attached to what I'm just, all of that's attached to verse 40. Every bit of it. And you and I've got to understand that we've got to run the race that God has set before us, and we have to run it by faith. And he's got the whole thing covered. It's all been foreordained. Your life, your race, your problems, the things you, do, the things you go through that God allows to go through for your endurance so that you can grow in your faith in God so you can learn to trust him and stop worrying about everything in your life that you can't control. <laughs> you understand that? Well, I don't know if you understand it, but this is what the writer's trying to tell us. I mean, that's what he's trying to tell me, and I'm trying to tell you, and he's trying to tell me, and I'm trying to tell you. Now, whether you want to believe it, whether you want to accept it, I can't do anything about that. All I can do is teach it to you, but I'm telling you, your butt's covered. <laughs> right? That's Michigan English. It's a little bit of Michigan for those who are visiting with the Internet. That's, that's Michigan. But see, that... I mean, I don't know what, what to say. I talk, I talk theology, and you, you go like, well, I, I don't know what he's talking about. And so sometimes I just have to be a, a Michigan farm boy. All right. In the King James Bible, they translated this, that they, without us, should not be made perfect. The NIV, because I just read the New American, the NIV Bible wrote, so that only together with us could they be made complete. See, everybody's on the same page. Everybody's on the same page with this idea. Because this idea has been foreordained by God. All these old, old covenant believers were looking for the messianic kingdom of God to come in each of their generations of time on earth in the plan of God. Just like we are looking for the coming of Christ. Look, it's one thing to look for the, Christ, for the coming of Christ. That's the goal line, but you still have to run your race. You still have to run your race. That's every day, every day, every day, every day, every day, until you die or till he comes. Agreed? Now, the wonderful thing about the people listed, there, they ran the race till they died and didn't get to promise. But they got the promise now for Christ come, we embraced it, and they got, they got completed with us. Right? Their faith was completed with us. The last runner of the medley relay. Yeah. When I ran it, well, I ran a medley relay in high school, and let me tell you, our, our closer, boy, your, my, our closer, we won, my freshman year, we won third in the state. Uh, 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 pretty good runners. And that last guy is everything. That guy you picked to run that last one has got to have the heart. He's got to have heart like you can't believe. And boy, we had a runner. And uh, every guy does his own. He tries to, tries to keep that, tries to keep, you always try to beat your group to give him a, 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 a lead. But let me tell you, boy, that guy's got to have heart. He's got to run till he ain't got nothing left to run. And uh, when you do that, you can do well with it. But all these old covenant believers were looking 
for the messianic kingdom of God to come in each of their generations of time on earth in the plan of God. This was continued into the time of the historical coming of Christ in 5 BC. Think about that. Those runners ran it all the way to us and passed that baton. Four, the writer of Hebrews showed the pivot of old covenant believers looking for the historical coming of Christ into the world from Abel all the way to Jesus Christ. Luke, in the third chapter, 23 through 36, laid it out. This was captured by Luke in the first three chapters, Luke 1, 2, and 3. What I'm saying to you, what Luke taught us, is that there were Jews looking for the imminent coming of Christ in 5 B.C. at the time of the birth of Jesus Christ. Let me mention some of these witnesses to you. Let me show you some of this pivot. One was Zacharias and Elizabeth. Zechariah mentioned at the birth of his son John the Baptist in Luke 1, 68, 71, this very idea. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption of his people. You know what they're talking about? This baby child that they know is Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the Messiah. The John the Baptist it's been sent to be the forerunner of the Messiah. And so he was. Simeon, he mentioned it at the birth of Jesus Christ in Luke 2.25. I'm going to tell you, I want you to write this down because sometime this week I want you to look at something. I want you to read the whole story of Simeon. That's going to be from verse 25 through verse 32. It is well worth your read and the application of prolipo. That prolipo in the middle voice, that, 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 that he's going to be part of the fulfillment of this word prolific. Prolipo, God has provided as foreordained. Do you remember that? You're going to see this. You're going to see it in Zechariah, a member of the pivot, and Elizabeth. You're going to see it in Simeon. You're going to see their, their, what was foreordained. They're actually going to be, they're actually engaged historically in the event. <laughs> Do you understand that? I don't know what you mean when you read this story of the Christmas story, but this is dynamic. The, I mean, God sent the choir from heaven and everybody. You understand? And these people, even the shepherds and everybody, Everybody was, I mean, God just, and these people knew that. They're experiencing it after all these centuries. These are the people, Zacharias and Simeon. Simeon was looking for the consolation. Isn't that interesting? The word consolation is paracletus. Jesus talked about it in John 14, 1 through 4 and verse 16. The comforter. You know who the comforter was? Jesus said in verse 16, I'm going to send another comforter. Huh? They were looking for the comforter of Christ. Christ said, I'm going to send the comforter back for the church age. Oh, I hope you see the pieces coming together in your heart. God foreordained all this. God foreordained all this. All the pieces in the puzzle of your life will come together too if you'll trust God. You fret about stuff that's already been already put in play. Just let it play out in your life. <laughs> Walk by faith, not by sight. Quit whining. Whining is, shows that you got your eyes on the wrong thing. You need to read Hebrews 12, chapter verse 1 and 2. Put your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter or finisher of our faith right? Got your eyes on all the wrong stuff. You got Anna. Anna in the temple with the baby Jesus in Luke 2.33. Uh, Luke 2.38. You need to read her story, verse 36 to 38. You know why? It's foreordained. She's living out the fore, foreordained. She's living out prolipo. That which was seen by God beforehand, she's now seen at hand. 
what God foresaw, she's now seen at hand, right? Beforehand, at hand. What a marvelous idea. What a marvelous idea. All of these people in Luke 1, 2, 3, all of the people in Luke 1, 2, and 3 are experiencing prolepo. What God forehand is at hand. Do you understand that? It'll, it'll change your life reading Luke 1, 2, and 3. It'll change your life. The Jews wondered with John the Baptist, when John the Baptist came into his ministry, the Jews wondered if he was the Messiah. He said no and gave them clues of how to identify him. <laughs> Luke 3, 15 through 18. Later, John gave testimony, I myself have seen. What was foreseen, right? What was at forehand is at hand. The forehand is at hand. John said, I have seen and testify to you that this, talking Jesus of Nazareth, is the Son of God, the Messiah. Oh, wow. Isn't that not marvelous? These guys, all of the ancestries, these Jews got to, got to do it at hand, foreordained, experiencing it. And why we can't is beyond me. We are now the, we are the cream of the crop people, right? We're the last leg. We, we're not looking for it. We're, we're way past that. The first coming of Christ that they were excited about and be part of, listen, that's past history to you and they We're looking for him coming, right? Oh, and just the eminence of his return. We don't live like it. We don't live in the eminence of his return. We say we believe it, but we don't live it. And if you had somebody big shot, really important to come visit your house, at least you'd clean the bathrooms, agreed? <laughs> there may be a lot, there may be no closets cleaned, but I guarantee the bathrooms are going to be cleaned, just in case. The odds are he probably never would go to the bathroom, but buddy, we make sure you could drink out of the toilet. I don't know why we don't do that. The most important person in our life is our Savior, and he's coming again, and it's eminent, meaning we have to live. We have to live as if he's coming today in this very hour. We don't, but we should. I encourage all of us. I'm not just, I'm just not preaching out. I'm preaching in. I think this is kind of interesting with Anna. When she said, I, we're looking, when she said we're looking for the redemption of the, uh, Jerusalem, she put, listen, the writer put, Luke put it in horeo. You know what horeo means? It means Ephesians 1.18. She was looking from the eyes of her soul. She was looking from the doctrine of the eyes of her soul to see what was going to be fulfilled in her very presence. That's the way we ought to live. That's the way we ought to live. It's the way we ought to live. Horeo. That's Ephesians 1.18. Let me close. When Jesus told his disciples that he must die by crucifixion, be buried for three days, and then be raised from the dead, they would not believe it. You do understand that, don't you? Well, you've read Matthew 16, 21 through 30 to 23, right? They didn't believe him. Even after his resurrection, Thomas refused to believe because his desire for the Messianic kingdom died with Jesus. Listen to that. You do know that, don't you? Oh, you better know it. Don't let that happen to you. John the 20th, chapter 24 through 29, you can read it again in your own, on your own. You know what we call that, what he did? We call that secondary negative volition. Listen to this. Even after 40 days of post-resurrection appearances, and just before his ascension, they still struggled with the, this very doctrinal issue. For example... 
in Acts 1 6, just as he was about to get on board and leave the airport. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, I'm in Acts 1 6 at the airport. He's going to leave in 11. Acts 1 11, he's going to leave. They said, Lord, is it at this time you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You know what they're talking about? They're talking about the millennial kingdom, which is not going to come until after the second coming of Christ. It's attached to the second coming, not the first coming. They still don't get the doctrinal point. So I love William, who says they, you probably have to hear it ten times to get it. Especially when you didn't get it the first time because you chose not to believe it. You chose not to believe it. You didn't get it the second time because you chose not to believe it. And the third time, listen, at some time you got to choose to believe it. Then you can move on. These people are stuck. They're stuck in secondary negative volition in their life because they won't believe. They won't believe. A doctrinal issue. A key doctrinal issue to their life. They didn't understand the doctrine of what later is going to be called the mystery of the church. You can read about it in Ephesians 3, 1 through 11 on your own. It's a good study, and you should do it. They didn't understand the doctrine of the mystery of the church that would separate the first advent of Christ from the second advent of Christ, and therefore would make more clearly the understanding of the millennial kingdom that they were looking for will not come until the second coming of Christ. All right? Now, if you think you understood my doctrine tonight, you're wrong. What you did tonight was hear it. You've got to go back over this doctrine and pay attention to the significant technical parts of it. And when you do finally understand it, then apply it to your life. Because it very well is a missing link in your spiritual growth maturity. Let's see. Hey, Rick, you, you want to handle, well, both my guys are gone today. Uh, prayer request. After a word of prayer, we'll do in-house prayer request. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for these who have come our way by the automobile tonight in our home Bible study. By home, I mean we're in Birmingham, Alabama, Roebuck. And I pray, Father, for those who have visited with us on the Internet across the world. You're not going to get it in one hearing. Let the Holy Spirit teach you the truth. Come to a place where you understand it and believe it, and it will change your life. And it won't change it until then. It won't change it. But it will change that after you believe it. Because that's where faith takes roots and is developed in your life with God. So I pray that for your life. Do not throw this, this away. Study it two or three or four times. For William, he studies it ten. He walks away with it. This is not one to throw away. A key doctrine. So I thank you for it, Father. I thank you for it. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth to our life. Truth will set us free from the cosmic system, John 8, 32. And we're thankful for that, Father. We're so thankful for it in Jesus' name. Amen.